Kia ora and welcome into yet another episode of the Kiwi Football Fix. If you're new to the show and you don't know what we do, we shine a spotlight on New Zealand football both here and abroad. And one of the things that we love to do is check in with our footballers who are overseas. We're doing it again today. We're going to the United States and catching up with James Musa. James, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all, mate. Now, listen, in the last month and a half, two months or so, you've re-signed with Phoenix Rising in the effectively the second division of United States football. What, what brought about this return to your former club? Um, yeah, so it was obviously a very interesting off-season. Um, obviously, with COVID and those kind of things happening, the market was very slow and um, a lot of players retain a lot of teams. Sorry, retain, retained a lot of players, um, so it made the off season very challenging. Um, and I had some dialogue with Phoenix in the off season, and they kind of hinted that they would like to get me back. And you know, I really enjoyed being here. Like we spoke about before, the fan base here is amazing. Um, you know, we're here to compete for trophies, and that's something obviously I enjoy playing for. And so I was happy to come back. If you've been there and done it before, why why would you go back? I mean, were there other offers on the table or was it just the, the lure of old teammates and old friendships that, that brought you back? So it was a bit of both, really. I mean, if you're, if you're looking at the U.S. Um, second division, the USL as a whole, um, you know, there's, there's definitely five or six teams that compete for the top every year and Phoenix is obviously one of them. Um, so that, that makes a big... Uh, you know, impact on your choice. And then in terms of facilities and stadium and things like that, again, Phoenix is right up there with the best. So um, it definitely made my decision easy and I'm very happy to be back. And after a wee while away from Phoenix Rising, are the, the same players still there? Is it largely changed in terms of your roster? Uh, yeah, it definitely has actually. Um, the head coach, Rick Shantz, um, is the only start uh, coaching member that was was here when I was um, last playing the rest is completely new down to the trainers um, and then in terms of the players there's probably five to ten players that was here when I was here and the rest are all completely new so it's it's nice it's a new challenge um, new coaching staff um, so it kind of feels like I'm coming back to a, a new club with with new people so um, new training field new stadium just got finished building so everything's completely different. Something that might help you is the fact that you've got a couple of New Zealanders alongside you in, in the, the Phoenix Rising mix. I'm talking about Declan Wynn, Noah Billingsley. What's it like having fellow Kiwis in this American outfit? Yeah, it's, it's strange, but at the same time, it's, it's really cool. Um, I was lucky last year as well to play with Noah and uh, Michael Boxall in Minnesota. And I think across my career, it might be the first time I've ever played overseas with another Kiwi. So um, it definitely makes, you know, we can have our own banter and we, we have our own little jokes from, you know, being back in New Zealand that other people don't get. So that's kind of nice. And it's familiar faces and, and things like that, which is, which is awesome. So what are you expecting then from, from your own um, uh, position in the team? You, you play as a a centre-back sometimes, a holding central midfielder at others. What has the coach told you about what your role will be in the upcoming USL Championship season? Yeah, so for me, coming back, that was part of the discussions in coming back, um, was that, you know, the coach was looking for a left-sided centre-back. And obviously, with my skill set and my ability on the ball, um, it was something that he was really interested in me transitioning into. Um, Obviously, I played a, a lot, a large part of my, um, the early part of my career as a centre back, and then you know over the last five years since being in the states, more more of a midfielder. Um, so the versatility has been great, um, but I'm you know I'm very determined to come in and 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 learn that centre position, uh, centre back role again, and make it mine and help the team in any way I can. We need to talk about uh, who actually owns this team, Phoenix Rising, because Didier Drogba, the former Chelsea hero, goal-scoring whiz, and former Phoenix Rising player as well, uh, he's a part owner. Uh, and you, ha you obviously had the chance to play alongside him a, a number of years ago when he finished up his career with the team. So tell me about that kind of experience, playing with a, a legend of football. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's about all, all the words I have for it. I mean, it's someone that I grew up watching. 
um, on TV and the Premier League every Saturday morning. And personally, my, my team is Chelsea. That's the team I always followed growing up. So to be kind of sitting in the changing rooms across from them and competing with them every day was a little strange at the beginning. It was a little daunting. Um, but at the end of the day, he's a good top guy. Um, he was he was 40 at the time, still running around like he was 25, <laughs> um, but was willing to help, um, you know, anything you needed. He was there for you and he was just a top guy on and off the field. And it's crazy to actually consider him a friend. Have they just tried to get as many famous people as possible to, to buy into Phoenix Rising? Because I think Diplo and Pete Wentz from Fallout Boy are also in the mix. Yeah, it's true. We The ownership group, is very um, vast. There's a lot of owners, um, and you're right. It does look like they've gone and got every big name they could, <laughs> and it's kind of crazy. You know, we we will be at a home game, and there's Diplo just standing there, and um, Pete Wentz, like you said, they're just coming to watch the games. And because we have guys like that in our ownership group, you know, it attracts other sports teams and athletes to come and watch us. And you know, we've got NFL players and NBA players coming to watch the games and things like that. So it really is like you know, drawing attention to the club, I would say. How often do they put on free concerts for you guys? So we've never had a free concert, but <laughs> they do do a lot of um, promo stuff and dollar beer nights and kind of, you know, they have a DJ set that Diplo put together as like, you know, pre-match stuff and things like that, which are pretty cool. It's another world. Um, speaking of yeah. another world, uh, the MLS. Uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, the, um, the experience throughout 2020. It was a, a COVID interrupted year uh, and obviously it led to your departure from Minnesota United. When, when you look back on that experience, how difficult was it? And, and did you get what you wanted out of that MLS experience? Um, yeah, so obviously it was a, a pretty difficult year around the board. Um, wasn't a lot of consistency in training or games with, with the whole COVID stuff. Um, and yeah, that obviously impacted me a lot because going into the season, the conversations I had with management was, you know, it was a Europe, like a Euro year, um, an Olympic year. So um, a couple of the younger boys would have been going away for that. And a couple of the older guys, the internationals would have been going for the Euro. So there would have been chances for me to get game time throughout that period. And then obviously COVID happened. So, there was no Euros, there was no um, Olympics. Um, so it made game time pretty difficult. Um, but I felt that with the game time I did have, that I did well. Um, it's just, you know, when you're at that level, the competition is, is very high and, you know, there's a lot of good players. Um, so they're constantly searching to find new players, better players, players from overseas. Um, so the competition is very high. What's your ultimate goal here? So back with Phoenix Rising, you've had that taste of MLS action. Is your desire to get back there? Is it to go somewhere else in the world? What, what are your plans in the next sort of two, three, four years? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, my, my aim and my goal always has been to play at the highest level. Um, and that's just anywhere in the world, really. Um, I'm pretty comfortable over in the States right now. I think this is my sixth season over here and my third with Phoenix. Um, I've also won a fair amount of trophies over here since I've been playing. So the only one I've kind of eluded me so far is the USL championship. Um, so that's obviously a big part of coming back to Phoenix and, and trying to win that too. Um, and then as far as getting back to MLS, you know, if I can hopefully get the championship this year and have some strong performances at the back, you never know. There could be an opportunity to step back into MLS. Um, obviously, the A-League is something I have my eye on too at some point, coming back home potentially and, and, and ending my career there. Um, so, of course, football is a big game. There's a, there's a lot of places in the world you can play. Um, but for me, it's just concentrating on myself and just being the best player I can and letting what will be will be. James, I'm glad you mentioned the A-League because every so often your name pops up as a, as a possibility of maybe one day returning to the Wellington Phoenix. Is it something that you think of often as, as much as we think of it back down here? It's not something I think about as much as I, I think my parents. <laughs> my parents <laughs> definitely think about it more than me because um, obviously they want their little boy to come home and, yeah. and, and play in front of them, which would be awesome to do at some point. Um, I just, at this point, I don't think the timing's been right. Um, from their end and my end, um, you know, 
I think my agent might, may or may not have reached out to them. Um, but yeah, it's just it's, the timing's never worked out so far. So you know, as I'm getting older, I'm 29 now, so I'm not that 18-year-old kid that first signed for the Phoenix. Uh, a lot more experienced, um, a lot better player. Um, so, you know, if they come calling for me at some point, um, I would definitely consider it, yeah. Take me back to the, the days of that 18-year-old. That was it a case of almost like deer in the headlights, oh my goodness, um, playing at a professional club for the first time, what on earth is going on? And then in the blink of an eye, it's over. Like, talk us through what that experience was like for you. Yeah, for sure. I, would, I, I wouldn't call it a deer in the headlights. I would more say um, maybe like a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding um, kind of where you are. Um, you know, you, you, you're a regular 17-year-old kid going to high school and then next minute you're thrust in front of th tens of thousands of people playing on TV. You know, it's like that transition, it's not an easy transition for anybody. Um, and I just think at that time, 10, 11 years ago, there wasn't as much um, assistance for the players to maybe go and develop at a higher rate. I think that's in place now. I think with the Wellington Phoenix Academies and those kind of things, um, it helps navigate those players through those early years and really prepare them for, for professional football. Um, so I, obviously all those experiences I learned from, and like I said, I'm not the player today that I was back then. Um, it's, it's completely night and day. Well, they've, um, they've been missing a few centre-backs, so um, if you ever want to step back in, then just let us know and uh, we'll be in touch with <laughs> David Dome and Ufuk Tele and we'll get, you, we'll get you a gig. It's funny you mentioned that because I think I checked my phone one day and I had like three texts from people saying, you should get your agent to contact Phoenix. And I'm like, what? What's going on here? And they're like, centre-back's gone down. <laughs> Three different people text me on the same day. Yeah, because they're playing Tim Payne at, at centre-back because they've had um, Devere go down and, I mean, they've got yeah. Stephen Taylor in. But, um, and, and Tim Payne's doing a great job. But, I mean, maybe it'd just be a lot better, a, a lot better fit having James Musa at the heart of the Wellington Phoenix defence. You, you want to give him a call for me? Mate, I've got <laughs> David Dome's number. I'll give him a bell after the show. <laughs> Oh, it's nice to hear that. Maybe, I need, maybe I need to change my agent. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm quite happy to dabble in that uh, arena if you, you'll allow me to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's lovely to hear that uh, at some point you do want to come back home because, um, you know, like to, to strengthen the team, strengthen the A-League, I think that those are all really positive things and, and you would bring that. Yeah, for sure. And um, even just thinking now off the top of my head, there's... there's a fair few players that are playing around the world that are kind of around my age too, um, all Kiwi boys that, you know, at some point I may like to come back to the A-League too. And, um, yeah, it could be, a, you know, in the future we could have a, a, a little reunion back at the Phoenix. All right, well, watch the space football fans. Let's get a little more serious, uh, James, if, if we can. Last year, obviously, was difficult with the COVID situation. Uh, it was made even more difficult in the States with the, uh, the death of George Floyd. And on the back of that, the Black Lives Matter movement really ramped up. And we saw not only outrage and uproar throughout America, but indeed the rest of the world. And, and you were right there in the middle of it, experiencing it. And, and yesterday was, it was a huge day, really, uh, with the, the guilty verdict handed down to George Floyd's killer. First of all, uh, James, what, what, did, what did yesterday's verdict mean, mean to you, having watched it so closely over the last year or so? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, the first little defeat. I think everybody was so outraged by the whole thing, especially living in Minnesota and experiencing it, all the backlash that came with it, with the riots and, and seeing all the police and the, the army trucks and all the armed guards. It was, it was really eye-opening. Um, so I just think for everybody, um, that decision was necessary. And I think, um, obviously, it's not done yet. There's not been a, a full verdict or a sentence, but I think we're on the right track. Um, obviously, there's a lot more stuff to clean up um, when it comes to the policing and the systems. I'm sure you'll ask me some questions about that. But um, I think it was a good day for, for most people in America yesterday. And we just got to see what happens moving forward. On the subject of the riots, James, um, I mean, how, how 
How involved were you? Were you out on the streets or did you see what was going on on the television and think, geez, I actually need to stay inside because it's getting a little bit testy out there? Yeah, so um, where I actually lived in Minnesota um, was probably 10 minutes away from, from where George Floyd actually passed. So uh, I don't know if you saw on the TV and stuff, they were obviously rioting and, and burning down buildings and all that kind of stuff. So they set a curfew at like 6 p.m. Everybody had to be inside their house. Um, all, you know, mom and pop shops, little stores, everything was had uh, wooden boards on all the windows. Everything was bought. It literally looked like it felt like you were in a third world country. And, and that's saying a lot living in America that it, it felt like that. Um, I personally didn't get involved in any of the riots um, or anything like that. Our team kind of told us to steer clear of that because um, you just never know what's going to happen. You know, um, it can be a dangerous place at times, you know, and, and you're in a world where there's a lot of angry people. So you never know what's going to happen. Um, but our team was very good at um, giving us assistance. And, you know, if guys lived in the city or near riots or things like that, they were offering like hotels so they could get out of there and keep their family safe and stuff like that. So the verdict of, of uh, Derek Chauvin has passed down yesterday and pretty much at the same time, uh, a young girl is, is shot dead by another police officer uh, in a, dom a domestic uh, disturbance situation. Um, so clearly there is still a lot more work to be done in the States when it comes to um, police brutality and race-related attacks. I'm sure you've thought a lot about this, uh, being in the States. What, what, what needs to change and are there steps being put in place already to affect change? It's a very good question and obviously, you know, I'm still learning about all of this stuff too because I, I, I think I was quite naive to everything when I, when I first came to the States and obviously you know, being African and having dark skin, um, you're kind of considered one of them, if you like. And um, I don't think I really understood the severity of it until, you know, this kind of happened and we spoke about it and, you, you know, you get educated from people and it kind of opens your eyes to, to different things. Um, in terms of steps that I think they're, they're taking, honestly, I can't really speak on that. I'm not too sure. Um, if there is anything, but even Noah and I were talking about it yesterday in the car. It's, it, it, it's a different world. It really is to like New Zealand. And, and when looking back on New Zealand, it's like, you're so thankful for where you grew up and, and the experiences you had, because this is just, it's night and day over here. Let's put it in a, in a football sense, um, because, you know, throughout, throughout the world, we, we see pretty much every week a, another instance of, of racism. It's either, uh, racist players, it's racist fans. Um, what, what, what have you seen? What have you witnessed? And, and how is that slowly changing? Because we're, we're seeing the governing body FIFA, UEFA in Europe, they're doing their best to, to stamp out racism, but is it working? Well, you tell me, if it keeps happening, is it working? No. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, there you go. So I... I think I think there just has to be a higher uh, punishment. You know, there's got to be more on the line for people to lose when these kind of circumstances arise. You know, because you know, of course, people make mistakes, and no one means to say things. But I honestly think that you you can be aware of what you're saying at certain times, and you know, you have to know your audience and what you're around. And I don't think there's a place for any of that in sport. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I thankfully have never heard or had anybody say anything to me during a game, um, but some people aren't as lucky. Um, I just think yeah, there needs to be a higher punishment for sure. Maybe it's, you know, exiled out of the game and things like that. And it's tough because sometimes people don't mean to do it. It can be, a, it can genuinely be a mistake, you know, but is it fair for them to get the same punishment as this person? It just gets into the kind of things like that. So, uh, I really don't have all, all the answers for it. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that as football keeps evolving and as the years go by, there needs to be more steps put in place to, you know, hopefully stamp this out at some point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with you. Look, James, uh, let's talk about um, your international representation now. Uh, it's been a wee while since you put on the All Whites kit. I'm sure you'd love to do it again. Uh, what, what have conversations been like with the, the current 
men's head coach Danny Hay. Is, is he in contact with you regularly about what you may or may not do when it comes to representing the country again? Um, I wouldn't say on, on a personal level, um, you know, personally about myself, but because it's been so difficult, obviously with COVID, the last, when was the last game? Two, almost 18 months ago now? Yeah, I think it was like 500 um, days ago, um, and that was a couple yeah. of weeks back. So, yeah, it's been a long time. It's been a long time, and obviously with no uh, certain games ahead, it's also difficult to plan. So um, we do have, I'd say, quarterly you know, team Zoom calls where we're all on it together and we all speak and, um, you know, Danny will update us on things. But as far as squads and, and all that stuff, it's so difficult because there's not even been an opportunity to pick one of late. What about in terms of the upcoming Olympics? And I know that you you would be an overage player. What, does, does Is that something that floats your boat? Like, would you want to be involved in, in Tokyo in, in less than 100 days' time? Yeah, that would be really cool. I mean, obviously, I was fortunate enough to go to London in 2012. Um, obviously, was a quite young then. I think I was only 19 or 18, so didn't get, you know, I wasn't a starter. I came off the bench, I think, for 20, 30 minutes. Um, so that was cool, but it would be a huge honor to go to, to Tokyo and, and be selected in a team like that, especially as an overage player. All right, well, I'm just making a few notes. So I've got to get in contact with David Dome about a potential <laughs> Knicks contract. And so who do you want me to talk to at New Zealand Football about the Olympics? Is that um, uh, Andrew Pragnall? I'll get, I'll get on the phone to him as well after we're done here. OK, so there's a couple Top of calls. Man. When you look at the, the draw for the upcoming Olympics, uh, I think the New Zealand men's team's been drawn against South Korea, Honduras, Romania. What, what chances do you give them? I'd say they've got a good chance. Um, the group of players that are playing and uh, that are under 23 now is a promising group. Um, there's, there are a lot of them playing overseas, playing at a high level on a weekly basis, which, you know, maybe in London or um, was it Beijing before that, you might not have had that as much, you know, players actually playing at a good, good level every week. So that will help them. Um, and then, Obviously, we know South Korea is a very good team. The Asian teams always are. But those other two teams are, are definitely, I think, the team and the coaches will be looking at those two as, as winnable games. Hey, look, um, I don't mean to keep on making suggestions for you, but um, I've got one last one for you. Because I've, I've seen on Instagram you've got um, uh, your, your love of music and you're playing the guitar and you're singing and you've got a hashtag, right, which is um, Monday Moose Tracks. But I'm, I'm wondering if Monday you actually. I'm wondering if you change it. I know you've just recently changed it, but my suggestion is hashtag Monday Music. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I don't know how you spell it to put it in a hashtag, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you. That's a, it. Would be like M O O S I C, right? Music. Yeah, I think yeah, that that can work. That can work. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, um, I'm sure the, the check is in the post, right? <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. How much are you charging me right now? <laughs> oh, I'm not much, mate. I'm just charging you your time for this chat here on the Kiwi Football Fix, mate. Oh, no money needed. No money needed. <laughs> Let, let's talk about your, your love of music. Is that one of your passions away from the game? Um, I'd call it more of a hobby. Um, just, you know, when you grow up in New Zealand, you, you take these music classes and pretty much I'd say every uh, primary school, right? Um, and we would play the guitar and I kind of liked it. I was relatively good at it. And then during like COVID last year, I thought, oh, let's pick the guitar up again and we'll play it again. And I got pretty good. So um, it's <laughs> Humble just- Humble brag, it's, I got I, pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I say it, I say it to my, my partner that it's more of just like a, a thing that I know that I can pull out at like a, barbecue or a campfire something like that that's kind of why i want to do it nice well keep it coming mate uh it's sounding great <laughs> and uh yeah it's it's awesome just make sure you go with that that new hashtag from now on hashtag monday music music <laughs> <laughs> hey james it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you on the kiwi football fix today all the best for the uh, upcoming usl championship season with phoenix rising and uh hopefully we catch you again soon yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate your time and having me on the show and for plugging me into all those different things and trying to get me new deals and this and that. It's really appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I've made the list, mate. David Dome, Andrew Pregnell, I'm, I'm coming for them straight away. There you go. Maybe one day we can do this in person too, if I'm ever 
ever come back to uh, New Zealand with those borders opening. Yeah, mate. Fingers crossed, eh? All the best, and thanks again for there your time go. today, mate. Awesome. Thank you so much. Our thanks again to James Musa. Awesome to have a chat with him. Great to hear from him, uh, a New Zealander doing good things over in the States. That's all we've got time for today on the Kiwi Football Fix, but make sure you tune in again next time here on Sky. Have a great one.